This reading is called The Butterfly Effect, and it's written by Dana Capasso. The delicate flapping wings of a butterfly have the power to set molecules of air in motion, in turn moving more molecules of air, a tiny act that is eventually capable of affecting weather patterns on the other side of the planet. This notion comes from a concept within, within chaos theory called the butterfly effect. Simply, the butterfly effect refers to a phenomenon in our world in which a small change in one place can result in equal or greater changes elsewhere. This may seem crazy, a tiny butterfly changing global weather patterns. But not only is the butterfly effect a real scientific theory, but it's also an intriguing philosophical idea. I say all this because the butterfly effect affects the way I live my life and the decisions that I make in a way that no ideas about God ever have. I'm no meteorologist, nor am I well-versed in entomology, but ever since learning about the butterfly effect, I have been attracted to it because it demonstrates an important principle that is often forgotten. Namely, each of our actions has effects that are more profound than we think. Interconnection is a major theme found in nearly all of the world's religions and philosophical traditions. The interconnectedness of our universe is also one of the most significant revelations of physics. All components of matter are interconnected, interrelated, and interdependent. As Unitarian Universalists, we affirm and promote our responsibility to remain aware of interconnection through our seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of all existence. Attention to interconnectivity reminds me, despite the many, many socio-political forces that work to divide us from one another, that I'm never alone in this world. It reminds me that each decision or action I make has reactions, at, and those reactions reverberate as waves moving back and forth across the globe. This compels me to live my life aware of the consequences of my daily actions, from the purchases I make to personal interactions with others. I certainly do not always succeed, but I try. My awareness of interconnectivity and efforts to work against the illusion of division remain my most significant spiritual practice. This spiritual practice also gives me the ability to stand in awe of interconnection, in awe of the butterfly effect, and the power that comes with it. On rare occasions, I am reminded to stop and appreciate the divinity of interconnectivity revealed before my very eyes. This, to me, is awe-inspiring. This, to me, is divine. So the seventh principle of Unitarian Universalism is respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. And I think if you asked most UUs what this principle is all about, most likely they would say it's about nature and it's about the environment. And that is totally correct. But yet the seventh principle that concept of interdependence and the concept of the interdependent web actually go beyond way further than just nature and the environment. The Reverend Forrest Gilmore writes that the seventh principle is our response to the great dangers of both individualism and oppression. He says it is our solution to the seeming conflict between the individual and the group. A famous psychologist once said, one cannot lead a life that is truly excellent without feeling that one belongs to something greater and more permanent than oneself. <clears throat> this is one conclusion that is common to all the various religions that gives meaning to people's lives. 
So Gilmore goes on to say that Unitarian Universalism is no exception. Our faith has been wise to reject the rigidity of fundamentalism and to stand against false understandings of the holy. Yet in our zeal for rejecting conservative theologies, we fail to be equally wary of the harms of individualism. In our struggle for freedom, he says, we may have given up on something vitally important in our lives, a dedication to something greater than ourselves alone. Concerned about this rampant individualism in our faith tradition, in 1998, sociologist Robert Bella, in his address to the UUA General Assembly, challenged us to give up our individualism and make respect for the interdependent web of existence of which we are all a part, our first principle instead of our last. And Reverend Gilmore, he agrees. He writes that the seventh principle is nothing less than a statement on the divine. And in that statement lies the profound hope for the healing of our world. He prays that we transform our UU sanctuaries of individualism into communities of awe and purpose and agrees that we should make the interdependent web our first principle and not the last and do so not just in words, but in all we do. So there is a pretty strong consensus throughout Unitarian Universalism that the seventh principle is really one of our more, most important and most compelling principles. And yet Unitarian Universalism lived for its first 21 years with only six principles. The seventh did not even yet exist. The seventh principle wasn't adopted until the UUA General Assembly in June 1984. And the great focus of this GA in 1984 was to actually vote on a whole brand new statement of principles, which was a thorough revision of the principles that were adopted in 1961, at the time the Unitarians consolidated with the Universalists to become one religion, the religion we have today. The Reverend James Ishmael Ford, he wrote for UU World and described the new 1984 version of the principles presented at the General Assembly, writing, when the document was pretty close to being finished, it was, frankly, mostly mom and apple pie. There was hardly a word in it that anyone of almost any spiritual tradition could argue with. It was what I would call the perfect product of a committee. Its most distinctive feature was the first principle, a declaration of the inherent worth and dignity of every person carrying forward a libertarian focus on the individual that had marked out English-speaking Unitarianism for its entire history. So you can tell Reverend Ford is also concerned about the dangers of individualism. But Ford continues taking us back to his personal vision of what that General Assembly was like. Then the Reverend Paul, L. Paul LaRue made his way to the microphone People who remember the scene say he was lanky and bearded and that he stood at the microphone with the ease of an experienced pulpit minister. He looked around, briefly stroked his beard, and then addressed the proposed seven principle and the one on the table for adoption. The wording was respect for the earth and the interdependence of its living systems. That might not sound too different from today's version on the surface, but it's very different. He says, in my mind's eye, as Paul stood there, the, the hall fell to a hushed silence. Out of the silence, Paul pointed out how that wording fell, fa fell far short of what it could be. So Paul LaRue proposed a new wording for the seventh principle, a call to respect the interdependent web of existence of which we are all a part. I'm pretty sure, Ford continues, although I have to admit there's no hard record of it, that with those words, the roof blew off of the convention center and a host of angels, divas, and other celestial beings from all the world's religions, past, present, and future, descended from the heavens, some playing instruments of astonishing beauty, while others sang a gloria that reached out to the farthest corners of the universe. The call to know that, in, know that interdependent web of existence of which we are all a part. And then it was over, the roof resealed and the beings were gone, only a hint of their song remaining in the hearts of the assembled, who then voted. 
They accept the proposed change, and with that decision, our little band found itself with an astonishing channel of divine blessing aimed at healing this poor, broken world. I suggest that in that hour, our future was articulated with as much authority as if it were from the tongue of an ancient prophet. So in addition to a challenge for overstatement, you're probably getting the idea that Reverend Ford um, in, addition, in addition to his flowery and facetious writing style, really, really digs the seventh principle, having gone to such great lengths as having to add angels to the story of its passing. And this was its passing at a GA in Ohio that he appears to even not have attended. But yet his point really isn't lost on me, and it shouldn't be lost on you either. The seventh principle is the force that moderates our rampant individualism and draws into connection with all that is greater. It's our insurance policy against that attitude of, it's all about me. You might find it surprising that the Reverend Paul LaRue, the person who suggested the final wording of the principle, and that part of the story was absolutely true, He's the guy who was responsible for taking the proposed principle of respect for the earth and the interdependence of its living systems to the interdependent web of which we are all a part. You might guess that this guy has a really strong earth-centered spirituality. And he actually spent a lot of time contemplating and reflecting theologically on his proposed rewording just because when he read the proposed wording, his heart sank and he had to figure out what was going on. So he reflected on this rewording before General Assembly, and he has actually written about how all of this played out, what was all of the influence be behind his desire to improve upon that originally proposed seventh principle. It turns out he was a student of something called deep ecology, a philosophy that values all living beings regardless of their rel relative value or benefit to us or their perceived value of higher or lower consciousness. He was also influenced by feminist theology. That's not T-H-E-O-ology, it's actually spelled T-H-E-A-ology, so thea as opposed to theo. He was affected by its emphasis on human interdependence, mutual caring, the sacredness of interrelationship, and the idea that morals and ethics are not simply just abstract ideals, he learned that women often base their moral and ethical decisions on the living structure of interdependent human relationships. He began to see the world as, as made up of more than what we call living systems. He says we must also take into account the non-living, all that is gaseous, liquid, solid, or perhaps in transition from one to the other. He says we may think of a sandy beach as non-living, but it's an important part of an ecosystem upon which living things depend. Everything, everything in the universe, living or not, is in interdependent relationship. And of course, Reverend LaRue's earth-centered spirituality is also inspired by his connection to nature, which he sees as a source of grounding in his life. So you can see how earth-centered spirituality influenced the very wording of our seventh principle. A reference to earth and living systems became an interdependent web. And the fact that we are in this web, and it's not something outside of us, became very explicit in the rewording. Earth and living systems could no longer be mistaken for things outside us. In fact, nothing is outside us in the interdependent web. So earth-centered religion, a term sometimes used interchangeably with paganism, has contributed more than the environmentalism of our seventh principle. It made our own interconnectedness a priority. In fact, the textbook, the Higginbotham textbook we're using in our paganism class right now, it says that interconnectedness is one of the two most essential central concepts of paganism. Notice it's not earth, or nature, or deity, or spirits, or energy. Most of the things non-pagans would probably guess. 
It's interconnectedness that is the most important. I often think what would happen if we all began to think interconnectedness first. I'm thinking about putting it on a red hat. <laughs> you see, emphasis on interconnectedness, interdependence, is countercultural in this area of the world that has been influenced by Western European thinking, not to mention Christianity. The Native American sense of interdependence was suppressed and nearly extinguished a long time ago. While those of the Western mindset see themselves as being independent of their social environment, residents of East Asian societies and Native peoples often have an interdependent concept of themselves. So that's why you hear more about interdependence in Eastern religion and indigenous religion. Native American religious traditions are rooted in a sacred relationship with the land, one's community, and the spirit world. Native American people cite an interdependent relationship to all natural phenomena, which drives their protection of sacred sites and living sustainably in harmony with the earth. Of course, in Buddhism, every person, place, and thing is seen as entirely dependent on other people and other things as a necessary condition for our very existence. For example, in this perspective, we are alive because we have food to eat, because the sun shines on the earth and the clouds bring rain, crops can grow. Someone tends the crops and harvests them, someone else brings them to market, yet another person makes a meal from them that we can eat. Each time this process is repeated, the interdependence of our lives links us with more and more people, with more and more rays of sun and drops of rain. Ultimately, ultimately, there is nothing and no one with whom we are not connected. So interdependence is seen as the nature of reality. We are all linked and we all affect each other. Although you may not hear about it as often, there are Christian concepts of interdependence. You might recall these words from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In a real sense, all life is interrelated. All men are caught in an inescapable network of, of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever ever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be, and you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the in interrelated structure of reality. So Dr. King apparently understood the butterfly effect and how it relates to justice. Madeline Langle, the author of A Wrinkle in Time, she was an Episcopalian who infused her novels with a spirituality that was applauded by religious liberals and vilified by religious conservatives. She also had a great sense of interdependence which coexisted peacefully with her view of God. She wrote, the stars are often referred to in Genesis. El Shaddai took Abraham out to the desert night to show him the stars and to make incredible promises. How glorious those stars must have been all those centuries ago when the planet was not circled by a corona of light from all our cities, by smoke, smoke smog from our internal combustion engines. Jacob, lying on the ground, the stone under his head, would have seen the stars as we cannot even see them today. If we look, and then she goes on to say, if we look at the makeup of the word disaster, disaster, we see dis, which means separation, and aster, which means star. So disaster is separation from the stars. Such separation, she writes, is disaster indeed. When we are separated from the stars, the sea, each other, we are in danger of being separated from God. So everywhere, everywhere one looks, you may find references to interdependence. But despite all of this, somehow our world and its people still suffer and are still in danger. Our seventh principle is not only spiritually rich and theologically deep, 
it is a really practical imperative because it is a genuine life or death matter. The inability of humankind to truly understand its inter interdependence is putting both the planet and its people at risk, at risk of death and destruction. It doesn't really get any worse than that. A global ethic, a global consciousness of interdependence is definitely past overdue. But if anything, I like to think of us, all of humankind, as some really big butterflies. We are big butterflies whose every wing beat has an impact. May we live our lives aware of the consequences of our daily actions. May this awareness become a spiritual practice, helping us to work against the illusion of division. May we stand in awe of the butterfly effect and the power that comes with it. May we use our wing beats to heal rather than harm, to love rather than hate, and to unite rather than divide. Amen and blessed be.